Well, we're going to be in Romans chapter 5 um, this week again. We're going to be looking at uh, verses 12 through 21. If you want to go ahead and open your Bibles, iPads, or iPhones, droids, however you read the word. I have noticed the slow transition when I remember when I first started preaching from an iPad, it was a it was a big deal, and pastors didn't know what to do with it. Some felt very comfortable with it, some didn't, and uh, it's an insecure thing. And I also noticed in congregations, like some people, you know, had had their Bible Bibles, and you know, a few people would use their phone, but it's almost like you're looking around to see, you know, if anybody else is on their phone. And now I notice in congregations, most people have have their electronic devices. That's the way that they're reading their Bibles. Just need to see over the past 10 years how that's transitioned. Well, it was uh, three years ago, uh, December of 2019, when uh, COVID was first, um, the first um, um, What's that? The first instance. Yes, thank you. The first instance, Kevin, of COVID was uh, discovered in Wuhan, China. Um, people started experiencing shortness of breath and, and running fever. And uh, some had believed, I know it's controversial, some had believed that it was uh, all traced back to a seafood uh, market. Um, some people say that actually it was traced uh, somewhere else, and people brought it into that into that seafood market. But a month later, it had spread uh, to Thailand, and within days, there was um, another instance in uh, Japan, and then like five days later, uh, the first instance in in the U.S. I think it was in Washington State was the first. Uh, uh, instance of COVID here in the in the states, um, and then within two months from that first instance in in Wuhan, China, um, on uh, actually the day after my birthday on March 11th, it was uh, it was uh, stated that this was a worldwide pandemic. It had spread across across the globe, and. Um, it's uh, it's it's not the worst pandemic that we've had. There's been there's been some pretty pretty severe pandemics in in our history. Uh, the New World smallpox um, pandemic in the 1500s and 1600s uh, killed between 25 and 56 million uh, people. Uh, the Spanish flu in the early 20th century, 1918 through 1920, it killed between 50 and 100 million people. And then the worst, the Black Death, uh, was in the 1300s. And it killed, I guess they weren't good at estimating these things, anywhere between 75 and 200 million people. The um, reason I bring this up is Paul talks about, in Romans chapter 5, he talks about the deadliest pandemic this world has ever known, and it started in Mesopotamia. Uh, it's killed an estimated 100 billion people to date. That's basically one out of every one person in human history has died from, from this pandemic. It's called sin. Um, as we're going to discover, sin isn't just something we do. It's a, it's a power that's working in the world. In Romans chapter 5, uh, Paul not only speaks of its origin, but we're also going to take a, a deeper look into its effects, into its uh, spread across the globe, and we're also going to take a look at the amazing uh, cure, the vaccine called the gospel, that has a 100% cure rate. So let's turn to Romans chapter 5, and we're going to start in verse 12. I think this is our third sermon in Romans 5. So, starting in verse 12, Paul um, 
Remember the beginning of Romans, he, he introduced this pandemic, he introduced this problem of sin in the world and how we're all guilty, we're all under uh, its bondage, <clears throat> and then he introduced the cure. He started uh, speaking about uh, the gospel, and he's going to present the gospel in, in different ways uh, throughout Romans. Uh, earlier in chapter 5, he's, he's talked about how sin has not just made us weak, but has actually made us enemies of God. But remember, the good news, the gospel is presented this way there, is that the good news is that God loves his enemies, right? And uh, yeah, and he sent his son to die uh, for his enemies to reconcile us, so that we could, we could go from being his enemies to being his friends. And he has drawn us close through the gospel. And so now he's going to talk about uh, this, the origin of this problem we call sin and uh, why we need a cure. And so in verse 12, Paul says, therefore... Just as sin came into the world through one man, that one man is Adam. Adam represents both Adam and Eve. So that's when he talks about one man. It's not that Eve didn't sin too, but he is the he he represents both Adam and Eve there. So just as sin came into the world through that one man Adam, and death through sin. Bible says that the wages of of sin is death. Death is here because of of sin. In the world, not meaning that um, every time somebody dies, they committed some sin that, that, that killed them. But remember, sin isn't just something we do. It's a force in the world um, that um, has brought about, brought about death. And so therefore, just as sin had come into the world through that one man, Adam, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Uh, Paul also says in Romans, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Paul says, for indeed, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. Paul says, but the free gift is not like the trespass, for if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin, for the judgment following one man's trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so we attempt to break this down uh, this morning. And we'll start with, I don't think this wasn't working this morning either, guys. So I might need y'all's help. Uh, I will need your help. So this, this sin is by far the deadliest pandemic. That's not just an analogy, it's a spiritual pandemic. It's a spiritual disease that has infested uh, this world. In fact, sin is the reason that all those other pandemics exist. This world is broken because of sin. This world is under a curse because of sin. God has partially removed his hands from creation, and the result is, is brokenness. Why? Because we need God. And so, as I said before, sin isn't just something that we do, but it is a power. It is a force that is in the world. And the reason that human beings experience death is because of sin. And so, just like those other pandemics had various symptoms, 
COVID uh, has, you know, we have respiratory issues. Uh, I think most of us have probably had COVID. Is there anybody in here who has not had COVID at all? Oh, wow. Nice. Nice. I've had it twice. <laughs> uh, well, there's a lot of us who have had COVID, and as you know, that, that uh, a lot of us either lost our sense of smell or our sense of taste or, or both. Uh, I lost my sense of taste on Thanksgiving, cruel joke. Um, no, actually, I'm sorry, I lost my sense of smell, so I was, I was still blessed with my sense of taste, but I couldn't smell anything. So I got up to open the fridge to start cooking the turkey and everything, and I couldn't smell anything. And I'm, how many of you rummaged through the refrigerator smelling everything that you could to try and see if you could smell something? Um, but anyways, the, the COVID has various symptoms. The Black Plague, uh, people would, uh, their lymph nodes would swell. And it was very painful and chills and, and uh, weakness. And so the, uh, what I'm calling the edemic plague of sin is not without its symptoms. And uh, the result of, of the edemic plague is, is what the, the Bible and what we call in theological circles spiritual death. There's physical death that was a result, but also spiritual death. And so, in other words, if sin is the disease, right, then sins with an S, the things that we do that are opposed to God, that are disobedient to God's word, those are the symptoms of the disease. Sin is the disease, and the sins that we commit are the symptoms that we have that disease residing in us. Does that make sense? Take a look at uh, Ephesians chapter 2, and Paul says, he says that you Christians, he's talking to Christians, he's talking to a church, he's writing to them, and he says, you were once dead, that's the disease, in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. So the trespasses and sins are the symptoms of that disease. So you were once dead, spiritually dead, right, because these people are still alive, so they're spiritually dead, that's what he's saying. You have this disease that causes the spiritual death and you once walked in trespasses and sins. Following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, that's Satan and his demons, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh. So living in the passions of our flesh is a symptom of the disease. Carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, again, symptoms of the disease, and were by nature children of wrath, just like the rest of mankind. Later in Romans chapter 6, Paul will say, For when you were slaves of sin, that's the disease, you were free in regard to righteousness, but what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed. So what fruit, what symptoms, were, uh, what symptoms were you showing? You were showing symptoms that you had this disease called sin. For the end of those things is death. The eventual result the, the, is, is physical death. Now he's talking about physical death. So in Romans 6.23, that's where Paul says, for the wages of sin is death, both spiritual and physical. Right? So sin has caused spiritual death within humanity, and eventually it leads to physical death. And in Romans 7, 24, Paul talks about a Jew who is struggling, who wants to obey God's word, who wants to follow after God, but he finds that he's a slave to sin, that as soon as he tries to follow God, there's some force that's working uh, within him that's keeping him from doing so. And so it all crescendos with him shouting out, who will deliver me from this body of death? Again, this body of death is both a spiritual and a physical um, um, problem that is going on within, within humanity. And so this sin issue, this sin pandemic, it's passed down both internally and externally. And so what I mean is this, just like what, what we've been talking about internally, it's, a, it's, a, it's what I call a spiritual DNA issue. It's, it's within, our, it's within our, our DNA, this sin that has been passed down. It's a disease. In Genesis 2.16, uh, God said to Adam, 
He says, you may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, because in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And as we see, as you read the story, they ate of it, and they did not immediately drop down dead, right? They would later uh, die. In fact, back then, he lived to 900 and something years, but eventually he would die. But within that day, the day they ate of it, uh, spiritual death entered in to the world. It was something that was residing. It wasn't just something they did. It was something that was residing in them. And so when Adam disobeyed, it opened the door to this sin problem. And so that's why Paul here in, in, in uh, chapter five, look, he says, um, for indeed sin was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Uh, verse 14, yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. So what he's saying there is, is that the issue of sin is deeper than somebody just uh, breaking uh, the direct commandments of God. So the Jews, when they received the law of Moses, I remember the Ten Commandments, and it's so much more than the Ten Commandments. You read Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers, and there's all kinds of, of commandments that are in there. And when they broke those commandments, it made them aware of, of the sin problem. That, that was part of the reason the law was there, to make them aware of the sin problem. Well, Adam, likewise, he was given a direct commandment from God. We just read it. Hey, don't eat of the, you can eat of any tree, but don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So he, he broke a direct commandment from God, right? And then later, a ways off, ways, uh, years later, uh, uh, Israel was given uh, the law and direct commandments from God. And so when they broke the, those commandments, they were aware that they were sinning. And so what Paul is saying, what he wants um, his readers to understand is that even between Adam and Moses, even though there wasn't direct commandments to follow, that sin was still having its way in people. Sin and death was running rampant. Does that make sense? So it just wasn't the things that they did. They did all kinds of stuff because they were exhibiting the fruit, the symptoms of that disease. There was still um, um, hatred and division and sexual immorality and murder and all kinds of stuff going on in the world. In fact, God at one point uh, floods the world because of it. Uh, sin is running rampant from Adam all the way up until the law of modus, uh, Mo modus. Moses and uh, sin and death is still spreading to all of Humanity. So, in other words, I said all that to say is that sin is not just an external issue, something that we do, but it is internal. It's not just sins, the fruit of our internal problem, which is sin. So it's an internal problem, but it's also an external problem in the world, the sins that we commit. I was watching an interview the other day with an, uh, an execution warden, and he uh, was asked about um, of all the years and his experience with uh, people that he has uh, executed and the different criminals within the system, if he's noticed any patterns. And he said, well, he said, yeah, he says a lot of these, uh, a lot of these people are without fathers. They don't have dads in their lives. And so we see here how the brokenness of a broken home, right? And you have... Um, uh, divorce, but then even, I mean, even in divorce, there's a lot of fathers that can stay uh, connected with the family, but, but um, men who have not taken the responsibility as a father, their sins, the sins that they commit, uh, doesn't just impact them, but it impacts those around them. It impacts their families, right? And so a lot of these criminals that he's seen in the system, a lot of them have been fatherless. It was passed on to them, Right? And so when that happens, there's brokenness in them, and they end up passing it on to the next generation. So it's passed on from generation to generation, trauma, abuse, um, even the opposite of that, like the pampering. It, it all affects how we, we show up, and it spreads brokenness uh, to the next generation. Anger, resentment, denial, defensiveness, it's all passed down from generation to generation. And so our sin, it has an impact. 
It impacts other people. A lot of times we think about, well, what I do is my own business, but we don't realize how much our sin, first it affects God, right? Our relationship with God, it impacts us, it affects us. And when we sin, it impacts those around us. I challenge you to ask those around you how, uh, name a sin, name uh, uh, an area of, um, of um, brokenness that you exhibit, and I challenge you to ask those around you how it impacts them. Selfishness, lust, control, our temper, it affects those. It, imp- it impacts the world around us. It passes on that, that brokenness. It creates more brokenness. It creates more brokenness in the world. And I, I do want to make a distinction between brokenness and sin is not the same thing. Now, sin is a form of brokenness, but not all brokenness is sin. But all brokenness is as a result of sin. Does that make sense? It's, it, it, brokenness is the effects of sin in the world. And so hunger, poverty. You know, going hungry or, or living in poverty is not a sin, but it is brokenness that is passed on uh, because of sin. All that stuff has entered the world because of, because of sin. People are oppressed. The, those being oppressed, that's a form of brokenness. That doesn't mean they're in sin, but it is from those who have sinned against them. So, we see that sin is not something that is just um, internal, but it is also external. Again, going back to the, we got the sin, which is the disease, and sins, which are the symptoms of that disease. And so it's passed down both internally and externally. Uh, but sin is also a problem that we can't fix. We can't fix. Why? Because Paul says that we're slaves to sin. We're slaves. We're incapable of fixing um, the problem. You think arguing over what does work and what doesn't work uh, with COVID is bad. Think about with sins. Human beings have never, ever been able to solve the sin problem. It's not that we haven't tried, right? We've tried to correct the sin problem, but what what, what usually happens is, is when we try and correct the sin problem, we usually end up compacting the problem even more. Attempts to correct it only impact the issue. It's like, uh, it's like somebody uh, eating well, right? Because they see gluttony in the world, and so they decide they're going to eat well, and they get this nice physique only to become prideful about their, about their physique. That's the way it, it usually works uh, in the world. Um, that's why I see life as a, as a pendulum, and I see when the world is trying to correct the sin problem, what ends up happening is the pendulum is on one side, and it swings all the way to the other side. It's, it's um, someone who is abused as a child. They correct it by giving their child children free reign, right? And they become their best friend, but they no longer become a parent. They're trying to correct the sins of their, their, their parents, right? And then they overcorrect and they contribute to the problem. That's the way the world uh, works, unfortunately. It's like correcting inequality by striving for power and control. Uh, a lot of the way the world tries to correct... Um, all the abuse and equality in the world is for striving it for themselves. That's the reason, like, cancel culture hasn't worked. The Me Too movement hasn't worked. The Black Lives Matter uh, movement uh, hasn't worked. Is because all of these systems are broken. They're broken. Communism is, is broken. Socialism is broken. Those systems were we're actually, in, in a way, put in place to try and correct a problem, right? Somebody saw a problem and they tried to correct it through communism, socialism. Guys, even capitalism is broken. There's not a system in this world that is not broken. It's an attempt to correct the problem, and it only compacts the problem. There's issues with all of those systems. And the reason is, isn't because we just haven't discovered the, the perfect system The reason is, is because it's all broken. Sin is in the world and we will not correct the issue. We cannot solve the problem on our own. God is the only one who has the cure. 
God is the only one that can reverse the effects of the sin problem in the world. And so Paul goes on to talk, you know, just like COVID, it began in Wuhan. It had, it, it had its origins. Sin began in Eden, and it began with one man. And so what does God do? He uses one man. In fact, it's God incarnate, Jesus Christ, right, to offer, to offer a cure. And so Paul begins to contrast um, Adam and Jesus Christ, how sin came into the world through one man and how God has af- offered a cure through that one man, Jesus Christ. And he says things like, he says, the virus began with a trespass. Well, the cure is a gift. It's unlike the trespass. It's a free gift. He says that the virus, it brought judgment into uh, the world because all have sinned. But the cure through Jesus Christ, it brings justification, a declaration that all who believe in Jesus Christ are now right with God. He says that Adam reigned through, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, that death reigned through Adam. Death reigned through this virus. That virus brought death into the world. Remember, both physical and spiritual. But he says that life reigns through the gift. It reigns through Jesus Christ, both physical and spiritual. So if death has a spiritual and physical aspect to it, so does life. There's, there's, there's physical life, right? That we one day will be raised from the dead. And so we have life beyond this life. But spiritually, if there's, if there's a spiritual deadness, there's spiritual life. And so that's why we say we were, uh, when we talk about baptism, that the, the baptism is a symbol of what happens to you spiritually. When you believe, the Bible says that you spiritually came, came to life. And so that's why Paul says in Ephesians, he says, you were once dead in your trespasses, but now you're alive in Jesus Christ. So death came through Adam, the virus came through Adam, sin came through Adam, and the free gift is the gospel through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's the one that brings life, and so life reigns through Jesus. And so what the uh, the gospel does, it reverses the curse. It reverses the curse. Adam's disobedience unleashed sin uh, into the world, and Jesus, which we call in uh, theological circles, he's called the second Adam. You ever heard that? The first Adam? Jesus is the, the second Adam. Because Paul says that, that Adam was a, a shadow. He was a type of Jesus. He points to Jesus in a way. So, so God knew in the beginning that one day uh, that, that Paul would be able to draw this analogy between the man who brought death into the world and the one who brings life. And so Adam's disobedience unleashed sin into the world, but Jesus, his act of obedience unleashed life into the world. Paul says that the cure is stronger than the virus. And here's the thing about about the gospel that's so cool is when it comes to the cure, the stronger the virus, in this case, the stronger the, the, the cure. Paul talks about grace abounding. Where is it at here? He says, um, yeah, he says, verse 20. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So the idea, um, any of you ever seen a grease fire? You ever had a grease fire? How do you put out a grease fire? What's that? With a lid, baking soda? Yeah. You don't, what, what, what don't you put it out with? Water. You don't put it out with water. And so most fires you put out with water, but a grease fire you don't put out with uh, water. And so in this analogy, you have... Um, you have the fire is grace, is the grace of God, right? And then you have water and you throw it on a grease fire and it abounds even more. And so this is what what Paul is saying is that sin only makes grace abound more. Why is that? 
Because grace is a, remember the gospel, the cure for the sin problem is a free gift of God. It's not something that can be earned, okay? And so grace by definition is undeserved favor. It's undeserved. So the more sin, the more it's undeserved. The more sin, the more it's undeserved. The more sin, the more the gift is, is undeserved. So it just, it just makes grace abound all the more, the more sin. In fact, later Paul's gonna have to say, does that mean should we go on sinning that grace may abound? Because the thinking here is like, well, wow, if, if my sin just makes grace look so awesome, right? It makes the gospel look so awesome, shouldn't I just go on sinning? He says, no, that's stupid. We shouldn't do that. We're new creations, right? We've, we've died to sin and now we're living for God, but it still doesn't change the truth that nothing can outdo grace and sin can never win over grace because the greater the sin, the more grace abounds. That's why I've said Scott Tutu, my opinion, I, well, I mean, I believe the Bible teaches this. I don't believe the Bible teaches sin, all sin is, 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 is equal. I believe there are different, I mean, spitting your gum on the, on the sidewalk is not the same as murdering somebody. I'm sorry, y'all may disagree with me, but I wholeheartedly don't believe that they're the same. I don't believe the Bible teaches that. What I believe the Bible teaches is that no sin can outdo grace. Does that make sense? So whether, whether you've spit your gum on the sidewalk or you're a mass murderer, your sin cannot outdo the gospel. Where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So I want to talk a little bit about this, this whole time we've been talking about this sin that is passed down from, from Adam and has spread all over uh, humanity and has uh, covered the world where all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, that's what we call original sin. In theology, you call that original sin. It had an origin, right? And it is spread across humanity. That's called uh, original sin. And one of the issues that people have with original sin is the thinking, well, if Adam passed sin to the whole world, then why are we held responsible? You ever thought that? You ever wondered that? A lot of Christians wonder that. It's like, ooh, if, if, if the sin came from Adam, right? It's something he did. He was the one who was originally disobedient to God. And now I'm just, you know, I'm suffering the effects of what Adam did. And now it's been passed on to me. And a lot of people have a, a problem with that. I think that original sin is, is harder to understand if what we call total depravity is, is true. And I think that's the reason a lot of people uh, have a, a problem with this. Total depravity is that uh, human nature is thoroughly corrupt and sinful. The problem with total depravity, I believe that in part, um, is that people cannot turn to God. Does that make sense? So, um, people cannot turn to God. And so the result is this. And so I see the problem. I see why people struggle with this. The result is like, okay, so humans have inherited sin and now we're slaves to sin. Okay, we've inherited sin. It's been passed down to us. And so we're born into sin, which I do believe. We're bo I believe we're born into sin. And now we're slaves to sin. But the problem is, is we can't turn to God. And yet we're still held responsible for it. So this thing has been passed on to me and I can't turn to God because I'm totally depraved and I'm held responsible for that. And so out of that comes, now this is Scott two and two, but out of this comes is, is what we call Calvinism is God chooses them if he, if he wishes. So we're totally unable to come to God by ourselves, but he chooses who, whose eyes to open, who to rescue and, and the rest are, are or drowning. I don't believe that total depravity is true in that regard. Here's what I believe to be the truth. We can't earn the cure. We can't earn the gift. 
nor do we deserve the gift, the cure. But God has given us the ability by his grace to receive the cure, that we can receive the cure. It's what I, 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 call, uh, I call sufficient depravity. Now, if you want to call it total depravity, and, and, you know, and you're welcome to believe what you want, you can believe the, the Calvinist view. Maybe we have Calvinists in here. I don't know. But if, if, if you want to call it total depravity, you can call it that. I, I've adopted the term sufficient depravity. Uh, Dallas Willard was asked about this, and he says, I believe that every human being is sufficiently depraved so that when we get to heaven, no one will be able to say, I merited this. No one will be able to say, I earned this. So think of it like this. Yes, the sin disease is passed down from Adam. I wholeheartedly believe that. I think that's what we've just been looking at here in Romans 5. The sin disease has been passed down from Adam, yet humans are held responsible. I do believe we are held responsible. Why? Not because we can fix ourselves, I think we've established that already. We cannot fix ourselves, but because we can turn to God. We have been given the ability to turn to God. We can't fix ourselves, but we can turn to the one who can. That's the gospel. I think it all falls into place when we see the gospel that way and we understand the gospel is that, yes, we are all depraved. None of us can earn salvation. And none of us can fix this sin problem. But you know what? Every single one of us can turn to the Savior. And so, I believe this is what Romans is teaching. And as we keep going, Paul will be unraveling this. God chooses not based on merit, but based on faith. The call is to turn to him. Turn away from your sin by turning to him. And that is faith. So, like a deadly disease, sin has been passed down to all of humanity, and we are all responsible to receive the cure provided for us in Jesus Christ. So, in closing, in Numbers chapter 21, we see the story of the people of Israel. They had been uh, disobedient and uh, God allows these serpents to enter into the camp and these, uh, these people are infected by these rampant snake bites. And so they plead with Moses to help them. People are dying from these snake bites. And so God tells Moses to fashion a bronze serpent and put it up on a, on a pole and that everybody who would look upon this serpent um, they would be cured of, of the snake bites. And so that's what he does. Notice in this story, if you want to read it, it's Numbers 21, verses 6 through 9. Short story there. When you read the story, people can't stop the poison on their own. There's nothing they can do about it. They're helpless. They're being bitten by these snakes, and they're all dying. But once Moses fashions this bronze serpent and puts it up on the pole, they're all told to look upon, to gaze upon that serpent. And when they do, they will be cured. So they can't stop the poison on their own, but they can look to the cure. Again, this is the gospel. We have a choice. John 3, 14 through 21, John says, Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. You notice that verse 16, the most popular verse in all the Bible, John 3, 16, it's attached to this story of Moses and the, and with the serpent. That's the idea. God loves, so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him would not perish just like they did from these snake bites, but they would have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. 
John says, and this is the judgment. Light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. See, Jesus is the light. And notice John doesn't say that people don't come to the light because it's impossible for them to come to the light unless God chooses them to come to the light. He says, no, they don't come to the light because their deeds are evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. So, in summary here, Paul is showing us that sin has an origin, and it came from Adam, and when sin entered into the world through his disobedience, it, it infested the world like, a, like a, a deadly disease, and it's been infecting humanity ever since, but God, from the very beginning, he had a plan to reverse the curse through one man. Actually, the Bible says that he became a curse. So that's another symbol there. When he was hung on a tree uh, in the law, it actually says, cursed is anyone who is hung on a tree. And that serpent, the serpent represents a curse. Ever since the serpent in the garden, it represents a curse. So you see how God was playing out the gospel way back in numbers with the people of Israel and with Moses when he told them to fashion this bronze serpent and put it up on a pole. And anybody who would look to that serpent, they would be healed. It's because God was foreseeing the gospel. He already, I mean, it, it wasn't just that he was foreseeing the gospel. He already had the gospel planned out. And all through the biblical story in the Old Testament, he's giving hints of what he's going to do through Jesus Christ. It was already planned. Yes, one man brought sin into the world through his disobedience, but I'm about to reverse it. And through one man's obedience, in fact, I'm going to do it myself because you're incapable of doing it, right? Humans can't fix it, but God incarnate can. And so he sends his only son into the world that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life by becoming a curse for us so that we could have life. And the cool thing was, is he died for our sins. He was cursed. He died on that tree, but he was raised to new life. And he lives today. He's in heaven. And that's how he could, he, 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 he could distribute his Holy Spirit to all who call upon his names. And when we call upon Jesus, the curse is reversed in us. And we are given new life. We're, that's where we're called new creations. But sin still is a problem. Even with Christians, sin impacts us even today. Not only the sin around us, not only the sins, and although we are no longer under sin, we, will still, we are still, we are still um, feeling its effects through death. All of us will die unless the Lord returns, right? So we've been given spiritual life, but we will die just like Jesus but we await that day that we will be raised to new life. Sin is the, 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 the worst pandemic to ever infect this earth, but God gives us the cure through his son, Jesus Christ. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Uh, thank you for the gospel, Lord. Thank you for all these stories, Lord, that you have um, put in your word for for our benefit, Lord, may we uh, learn from them, may we grow from them, may we continue to be transformed from them, Lord. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you for the cure. We thank you for Jesus. We love you so much. Love you so much. Thank you, Lord. Amen.